Welcome to another In Wheel Time podcast, a 30-minute mini version of the In Wheel Time car show that airs live every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing that we even get this show on the air. Welcome to the Inwheel Time Car Talk Show. Just ahead, Pike's Peak Hill Climb Head Cheese. Oh, boy. Richard Tomlin. Also, Jeff has this week's racing calendar, and Mr. Mars offers five cars under $15,000. And wait till you see these, this lineup. Howdy, along with Mike out of this world, Mars. We need more Jeff Zekin and IT Director of Engineering, David Ainsley. I'm mm-hmm. Don Armstrong. Glad that you could join us today. Let's switch over now and uh, see if we can talk to Richard Tomlin. Hello. Come in, Richard Tomlin. Good morning, gentlemen. Oh, my God. He's there, and we got him. I can hear him, I can see him, and it's the truly first amazing. First time for everything, right? There, first time for everything. <laughs> Where are you? Colorado Springs. Where? Oh, boy. Yeah. Colorado Springs, Colorado just outside Spring. of Pikes Peak. Yeah. Yep. yep. I was there a couple of weeks ago, and I want well, you to know. I guess we're over in Estes Park, too, so lots of people up here right now. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, we saw them setting up because I actually went up Pikes Peak two weeks ago. What'd you think? I was scared to death. Did you take the Corvette? No, I did not take the Corvette. I had a Lexus okay. RX 450H Plus, lovely vehicle. But uh, the problem wasn't with the vehicle or the weather or anything else other than me. I white-knuckled it up there, <laughs> and especially on those switchbacks. I don't know how anybody could have their foot to the floor at any point going up Pikes Peak. I just don't get it. And will I ever go back again? No. You'll have to cart me up there in a hearse. To get yeah. me back up there. The, so you saw the starting gate where we actually start the race. Yes. So then they were preparing the record, everything. They were preparing yeah. everything while I was up there. The record from start to finish is seven minutes and fifty-seven seconds. Here, let me answer that with you. Oh <laughs> hell no! <laughs> it's no. Uh, it's something that even us as racers, it's it's hard to believe because daunting. It's so fast. It's so quick. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that uh, some mental health care uh, should be available down at the bottom of the mountain because those people are crazy. Yeah, so we're uh, we're aiming for a sub ten minute in our car this year. Wow, uh, we ran a ten twenty six last year. And sub ten minutes. We're on target to break ten minutes um, to cover the twelve point four three miles, one hundred fifty one hundred fifty six turns uh, to the top of Pikes Peak at fourteen thousand one hundred and ten feet. Yeah, I, I'm very well aware of all of that. <laughs> uh, the switchbacks, the three switchbacks that uh, as you reach the the peak of the mountain yeah. itself. The W's. Yeah, that is uh, frightening to say the least. If you if you want to die of a heart attack, well, there's there your is, answer yeah. right there. Yeah, so during practices, we actually tow the cars up. So you've got the Ram truck, 2500 towing a 30-foot enclosed trailer. Um, and there's a line of, you know, 25, 30 of us going up there. And uh-huh. That uh, diesel truck that is uh, tuned for Houston sure does like to smoke a lot up here. I bet. So, kind of gives you a bad feeling. But yeah. It's uh, it's interesting around the switchbacks and the W's getting up there with the big trucks. It's, uh, it's a very um, cautious maneuver that's made. Well, I, I saw something interesting on the way up there myself. I saw a school bus that uh, had, had a whole... Had a, had a whole bevy of people inside of it just regular people hanging on for dear life <laughs> as this as this driver was running up those like like he did it every day which he, the gears. yeah and he did it every day clearly uh and i i i didn't pull i thank god he didn't get behind me but there was a law enforcement officer that was behind me for quite some time before i could get over to the side to let him go by Right. So yep. here I am, yep. Grandpa Don, hanging on, white knuckling it all the way. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you'll be okay. You <laughs> well, I am now. Now that Good I'm time. now that I'm down here, about fifty feet above sea level, I'm feeling a lot more comfortable, and I can breathe. Yeah, breathing is a real thing. Our driver runs oxygen um, on the way up, and it helps them because heart rate's so high. Once you actually get up into thinner oxygen, it does become an issue. Your heart rate is high. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> I'm about to die. Not, and it's not because of the lack of oxygen up there. It's because well, of fright, I can tell you that. What's interesting is we tell people how 
high it is and how extreme this event is. But until you actually drive the road like you did, you don't realize how high and how extreme it is. And the fact that it's been going on for 102 years is even more impressive. Well, you know? and, and here's the other thing. You know, that path up there from one point to the top was not always paved. Correct. It was basically a gravel road. Uh, and that in itself is like, you could slip off of this. Nah, we, no big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. There are men running now that actually ran when it was all dirt and run now when it's all asphalt and they feel that it was safer on dirt because they had more consistency knowing exactly what the car was not going to do um then when you actually have the grip and the grip goes away and then you're just along for the ride okay so this is an interesting conversation for these men to say the least um mm-hmm. you know it, it, it's kind of it kind of builds and you really don't expect it. Okay, yeah, we're going up this grade, and it's no big deal. And you, then you pass that point where they give you the little sticker for your window, and then you're on your way, and it's this a little bit steeper here, a little bit steeper there. And pretty soon, you're damn near, yeah, all you can see is sky. And I'm yep. going, this is not good for me at my age. <laughs> um, and... Um, the other, the other thing is that um, it, it, is, it is one of those deals. I have to ask you this. Do they run slicks? Yes. Yeah. Wow. They, Absolutely. They run slicks. Yeah. Oh. Even run tire warmers in the pits to warm them up first because you don't get a chance to have a warm-up lap or a you know, warm-up area. So you either have uh, tire heaters, tire warmers, like you would see in F1 or any of the bigger race series. Um, or you use a propane heater to heat up the center of the rim, uh, which thereby heats up the carcass of the tire. Oh, or you do it old school and you just set them on a skate and keep them in the sunlight until you have to put them on the car. Why? Why? And I get why, as much heat. As why did you raise your hand to do this? <laughs> you know, I always had a lot more faith in you that you were a sane person. I, I just uh, to to all right. I won't even go into so, that. But here, here, so let's 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 go into the sane part. Um, Hop on and pull on Yuri. He's on, he's on hold in the group. Yuri is our driver uh, that will be wheeling the car up. He's the one that qualified third in the open wheel class. And you can ask him about all that because he's the one that's truly the madman. I just built the machine. He's the one wheeling it up there. Yeah. Have you ever driven it? Oh, yeah. I've driven it plenty of times. Yeah. Do we have so, is that Yuri that's with yeah. us? Yeah. Wow. Yep. You should have Yuri right there. Yeah, I see him. Yuri, can you hear us? Can you see us? Yes, sir. I can see everybody. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Yeah. So what's it like inside the insane asylum? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and is that the is that how you're describing the car? Or uh, which one <laughs> particular is the part of the team? The whole kit and caboodle. Yeah, everything. Dude, I, so a, a, what is the top speed that you go as you're uh, heading up the mountain? So we are gear limited strategically to about 123, 124. We can bump the red line a little bit to pick up a few more mile an hour. Uh, Qualifying is probably the best place where we got a sense for the actual top speed we're going to hit. You know, we're a little bit lower on the mountain where we can use our horsepower. And we have a couple of straights. So we tickled, I think, 115 or 116 uh, in qualifying on Wednesday, I believe. So, huh. or Thursday, Thursday. Yeah. So we're we're close. We're close to our red line. We picked we picked our gearing just right. Um, but yeah, it's also I think it's a good thing because with the way that being on a highway essentially, uh, the braking zones are not braking zones. It's you know you're just braking on a road basically. So I think it's a good thing that we're capped right there. Do you ever look down? <laughs> uh no. <laughs> you never look down. Uh, you're talking you talking about down at the dash or, or down at the uh, down to the side of the car? Down the side of the car when you're teetering on the edge of the roadway that has no guardrail. It is it is hard to ignore it just out of your peripherals. And obviously I you know, I have a I think in a good and a bad way, I have a better appreciation for it than you know, some of the drivers that fortunately have not experienced what's you know, what's on the other side of the white line. Uh, but but no, it's it's there in your head. Uh, it's always a good gut check, but no, you're you're basically laser focused on the two white lines. It's not tunnel vision because your peripherals do pick up a lot, uh, but I definitely am always aware of where the drops are. You just you just try to make the circuit as flat and as streamlined as possible. So 
your gaze is only where it needs to be, and you're basically just picking up your, your visual markers for either turning or break. Yeah, and there was a song written about that. It's called Jesus Take the Wheel. Is that what it is? That's what it is, yeah. yeah. Um, well, hopefully he sits this one out on Sunday, and I'll, I'll take it to the top. Yeah. Well, we, we, we certainly wish you the best of luck, and, uh, and say, a prayer for, say a little prayer for me, as, yeah. as, as they say. Where is it going to be broadcasted? Can we watch it? Yes, yes. So it's basically going to be live streamed on Mobile One's YouTube channel. Okay, that's um, what it is, yeah. So I, I don't actually know the link, but you know, for all my friends' family, I just tell them, hey, go, go look up Mobile One, live stream, type that into YouTube, and that, that should bring you there. And, you know, Pike Speak does a pretty good job as far as the organization. They'll kind of fill in some of the uh, some of the quiet time or downtime. They'll have some other drivers come into the booth and talk, and they have kind of a you know somebody takes point and talks to you through some of the points of what's going on while cars are running or while we're having a little bit of down. Well, as I white knuckled my way up there at about five miles an hour through those switchbacks, all I could think of was, okay, so we got all of these people up there, racers, trailers, uh, 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 tow vehicles, everything is up there, and you know. When I was up there a couple of weeks ago, they were setting up the porta potties and that sort of stuff. But there are only a couple of areas that I saw. Of course, I was also laser focused, mm-hmm. if you, to use your term. Um, I, a couple of areas up there where I could see where you guys could kind of pull off and where it looks like they've cleared a little bit of an area, a couple of places on the way up the mountain. Is that where you guys camp out? How does that work? Yes. Yeah, so for for each practice section, essentially, they're it's strategically put. You know, they strategically have staging lots. So Glen Cove is a natural place that's usually for for downhill descent for visitors. That's a place where you can pull off and cool your brakes after coming down from the switchbacks. Yep. Um, Devil's Playground is also a big staging area. It's not really a paved lot. It's just dirt because of just how rough the conditions are there yes. most of the year. Mm-hmm. And I like um, the way that they call it Devil's Playground. That's that 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 doesn't work for me. Yeah. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So no, they have they have some good spots uh, to pull off. Now, if you have a mechanical issue, just depending where you are on track on race day, that's where you get you have to get a little bit more creative. You know, and, and some guys, you know, unfortunately, they have downtime or they, they experience a failure somewhere in the W's and the switchbacks. And uh, you very you have very little pull off room there. So and you're on a very steep incline. So you better hope your parking brake works and you can keep it in gear and, and whatnot. But essentially, it's, you know, the, the race has been running, you know, for over 100 years. So there's they figured it out now where where everybody needs to stage and wait and you know it used to be even crazier because you know when low brand in what 2013 you could actually see it was very much of a rally feel you know you had spectators sitting there right in every apex around every corner basically a couple feet from the car maybe some people got within inches of cars and so they the committee decided to kind of push the fans back a little bit so they're they're a little bit more clustered um you know halfway picnic ground ski area the cove you know there's places where where the fans are packed in and get a good viewing but do you ever used worry, to be a little bit do you ever worry right. about things like a broken axle in the switchbacks that would uh, be a little bit uh, uh nerve-wracking i uh i worry about everything honestly uh it, but uh, once again going back to the laser focus comment uh you know i trust in the team to keep me safe that's about the only thing I need from them. Uh, you know, if we have we lose power or if something doesn't quite run right electrical wise, I'm not upset. You know, my main thing is I just need brakes and steering. Everything else is on me. And yes, I definitely worry in the switchbacks and the W's. That, to me, that's the most dangerous spot. We have the biggest drop off, so that's that's it's in the back of my mind. But you have to curb that anxiety and that fear for sure in order to be able to even drive through there at speed. So, Richard, uh, the uh, U joints in these things about the, about the size of a basketball, or how, how does that work? <laughs> no, um, actually, they're a uh, regular Ford 8.8 inch uh, U joint. Something you can actually walk into a Riley Auto, a Riley Auto Zone, and buy. <laughs> oh my God! Really. Absolutely. So, you, I mean, you, you don't use super heavy duty, for instance, you, U joints on. You re, on, yeah, or you refresh everything annually and you inspect frequently. Yeah, and uh, what it's about it. the actual axle shafts themselves? Axle shafts, funny enough, are actually Miata axle shafts. Oh That's what we run in that car. Yeah, how does that make you feel? No, uh, it doesn't make me feel no, any better at all. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, 
it's pretty amazing how some of this stuff actually works. Um, and then again, it's just verify, 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 trust, but verify everything. So you don't worry about overpowering any of these components? We've tested them very extensively over the years. I mean, remember this car, we first campaigned it up here in 2016 and, uh, it's been to real Mexico a couple times. And I mean, we've gone through four or five sets of tires in the last probably three months, four months at MSR. So testing down locally um, with better temperatures and better grip than what we have up here, uh, we're very confident that we've engineered a piece that will survive. What is the current temperature up there on the mountain? Depends on where you're at altitude-wise. Uh, the other morning, we, when we pulled up to the top, it was 29 degrees when we got there. Um, that was one of the days we did not get testing. Cloudy, windy, um, below freezing. Uh, before we left the mountain, of course, it was back up to 42, and then at the bottom, we're, you know, 74, 75 at the bottom. Now, let me just tell so, everybody that hasn't, hasn't actually uh, lived this sort of thing. So, I get up there to the very top of the mountain with the visitor center and the nice parking lot, and there are still mounds of snow all around, and the kids that have never seen snow are out there throwing snowballs and having a good time, and I'm going to say, I'm just going to stay here in the car mm -hmm. if that's okay with you. A little yeah. hot chocolate. Yeah. It, 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 it I don't think most people realize that you could be in your shirt sleeves at the bottom of the mountain. In the top of the mountain, you better have a jacket on a day like you're talking about. Yep. Yeah, it's, uh, it's bizarre the weather changes that you'll see. And we've had race days where at the bottom it is 80 degrees at the start of the race. And by the time they get to the top, they've actually had to send cars back down because there was enough hail coming down that the cars couldn't drive up. Yes, I've, um, I've heard those is, stories. But, Mother uh, Nature is, is a real thing. Well, so uh, yeah, and let me tell you something. At 14,000 feet, friends, you're in the clouds for the most part. Mm -hmm. The day that I visited, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was absolutely perfect. Thank you, God. But uh, I can only imagine, and I've been at altitude where I've – felt and seen all of the clouds that are blowing by me at you know 50 miles an hour and there's uh, snow in the middle of summer so i've experienced that and i know so do you guys run even though the weather is inclement yes you'll run no matter well until they feel that it is unsafe to run and then they usually red flag the race wait for weather to clear and then we'll start up again <sighs> yep okay well it's a process. It is a process, yeah. and I'm I, my process is trying to wrap my mind around all of this and going. And now that I've visited recently, going. Mm. Well, make sure, make sure you log in on a mobile one uh, YouTube tomorrow and take a watch. We'll be the twenty second car off the line. Um, so figuring, you know, three to four minutes a car. Um, I would hope that we're off by. I guess your time would be about ten thirty, maybe eleven o'clock. Ten thirty, eleven o'clock, just in time for yes. church to get out. In wheel yep, time yep. needs needs a uh, a race team. We'll call it Scaredy Cat Racing. Scaredy Cat, <laughs> <laughs> Don Armstrong, white knuckling it all the way there. Oh my God! Well, best of luck to both of you. We'll be watching. We'll be keeping our fingers crossed, and we're thinking first place. There you go. That's it, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yuri. Thank you too. Right. God. Scaredy Cat Racing. <sighs> white knuckle racing. Yeah, something. <laughs> yep. The In Wheel Time Car Talk Show is available 24-7 through the iHeartRadio app. Uh, Just look for In Wheel Time Car Talk. <laughs> Podcasts on your favorite podcast provider. We also video stream our three-hour weekly show on Facebook, YouTube, and InWheelTime.com. The In Wheel Time Car Talk Show will continue after this quick break, we hope. So stay with us, will you? Pro-Am Auto Accessories has been serving Houston's auto enthusiasts since 1984, providing world-class products for sports cars, European sedans, and American muscle. Pro-Am is known as the place to go to find exclusive and hard-to-find parts and accessories. Pro-Am is one of the very first distributors in the USA for brands such as Recaro, Redline, Momo, Corbo, and Simpson. Located in the heart of Houston's premier retail and service corridor, the Galleria area, Pro-Am's walk-in storefront includes an 8,000-square-foot warehouse, showroom, and install installation bays. Pro-Am not only sells parts and accessories, but also offers installation and service. Pro-Am is now reaching a worldwide audience through Pro-Am.com, taking its local reputation to the rest of the world. At Pro-Am Auto, you'll be dealing with a small group of professionals who truly want to help you with your automotive needs. If you don't see what you're looking for on the website, call and Pro-Am will lend you a hand. 
Pro-Am Auto, 6125 Richmond at Green Ridge and Houston's Galleria area. Call them at 713-781-7755. Want to feel good about something special you did for someone special? In Wheel Time and the original Loopy Tortilla group of Tex-Mex restaurants have joined together to help a very worthy cause, God's Garage, a Christian-based 501c3 charity. We know there are lots of places and organizations out there where you can donate a car, truck, or SUV, but we're asking you, our car enthusiast family, to consider donating to God's Garage. Visit godsgarage.org and learn about its mission, the women that have been helped, how each one is screened, and about their Restore You program. A car donation is an easy way to make a difference in the lives of others. God's Garage needs good operating vehicles, but will take all types in working and non-working condition. Make your heart and soul feel good by donating your gently used vehicle and help support single mothers, widows, and wives of deployed military at godsgarage.org. Welcome back to the In Wheel Time Car Talk Show. Time right. now for the racing calendar. Yes, I've and got some clearly stuff clearly we've going. got one big one coming up yep. tomorrow. you got the big one. But, you know, last week we didn't have a lot going on. And there's something I forgot to mention. It was the 24 hours of Le Mans last week. So a lot of the F1 drivers and some of the open wheel drivers were in France doing that. So my faux pas on that. But tomorrow... Uh, June 23rd, you got Virginia NHRA Nationals in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, it comes on uh, about 3 p.m., but the station it's on is to be determined, so it'll probably be a rebroadcast. You got NASCAR tomorrow, uh, New Hampshire Motor Speedway, so a lot of East Coast stuff going on. New uh, Hampshire. New Hampshire. Uh, tickets are still available, Mike, if you want to go. Oh, man. So it's going to be on USA Network. I can only imagine you taking your accent up there to New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Give me some chatter. Uh, with jalapenos. So, uh, the Aramco Spanish Grand Prix is going on from Friday till tomorrow. It is F1, so if you like F1, this is what you need to be watching. So, there you go. Indy. IndyCar is at uh, Laguna Seca tomorrow. Uh, it's always a cool track to do. Indy's always good to watch. And, of course, IMSA is at Watkins Glen, another road course. That is cool as well. So, tune in on all of those networks. Okay. Mr. Mars has a special feature. Five cars <laughs> under $15,000. Mm -hmm. I was thinking more along the lines of under $5,000 when I saw the cars that you were going to put up. Well, so, so the so, idea no, was... So, what is, so, yes, so what is the was, idea? If you were a young person, a younger person, and, or somebody even your age, for example, and you well, wanted Well, thank you for start, throwing me into that. If oh, you boy. wanted to start a car collection or you kind of wanted to start getting involved in the hobby, what do you, what do you look for? I mean, it's easy to say, oh, I want a 67 GTO or I want a 69 Camaro or 69 Boss Mustang. It'll cost you thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Oh, yeah. Not everybody can start that away. So I was trying to find something that you might could start with that might actually be a vehicle. Is this a car that you're thinking maybe your granddaughter could uh, get into? Uh, one of them or two of them could be, yeah. But I was thinking more of something that people seem to be having an interest in that might actually be uh, appreciating in the near future. For example, the uh, Mazda MX-5 Miata is a very popular car out on the track. Richard Tomlin and them run them all the time. But the very first year, known as the N.A., is the only one that came with a pop-up headlights, and they are uh, something that people are looking for because they are rare in the world of the Mazda Miata. So that's something that might make that special. The N.A. The N.A. is what they called it. Not available. It was the very first year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's got the pop-up headlights. You could have a 1.6 or 1.liter engine, uh, five-speed or an automatic. So it depends on what it is, but it could be something that in the future would appreciate just because there's not a lot of them around. Another one that is a very similar thing is a Toyota MR2, particularly the AW. MR not. Oh, yes, MR. <laughs> MR2. Yes, MR2. <laughs> An AW11. Now, this is, again, the first generation of the MR2 that was produced uh, from the 84 to 89. It is a mid-engine, so that's one of the things that makes it very different. Uh, it has a very distinct wedge shape. But it's the very first year that it was built, so there's not a lot of them around. So, again, that's something that could add to the yeah, appreciation of a collectability. I could see it. Now, the Volkswagen Golf GTI MK2. Now, this is the second generation. Would that of be the, the Mark II? Uh, it's the MK2. The MK2. 
It is the second generation built in 84 to 92. And it was part of that hot ha hot hatch era. It really kicked it, yeah. things up because of the performance with it and the handling, the build quality. They scream. And uh, yes, they did. So again, something that could become uh, a little more valuable in the future. The Jeep Cherokee XJ. Now this is one that um, you got to kind of take it with a grain of salt or leave it. You know, it's it's. <laughs> <laughs> or leave it. It was built the side of the road. 1984 to 2001, <laughs> and it's considered one of the things that led to the popularity of the SUVs. It's, and it's where it came in with the SUV with the off-road capability. It's a two-door. It's the F1 of That Jeeps. is a two-door version of it, 4.0 liter uh, engine in it. And with a V8, with no horsepower. With the inline six. Uh, oh, a lot six. of torque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, some people have put V8s in them. You know, so it, again, it's something that could be collectible and is reasonably priced at this level for a collectible car. And then the last one that I was going to talk about is the Ford Mustang Fox Body, 1979 to 1983. Now, this thing in particular, as we talked to the Mustang guys, like Randy and them, they this is something they mention a lot of times is the Fox Body Mustangs because of the had a 5.0 liter V8 in it. So it was a pretty hot rod because it was pretty light, handled fairly well. Uh, and then it's just a matter of, you know, body styling. Do you care for that kind of a body style on a Mustang? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, but the engine and the popularity among the Mustang guys are what make this potentially a, a car that will appreciate in the future, therefore making it collectible. Oh, well, there you go. Would nice. you buy that? The Mustang, I did, I, they all have a little bit of a tickle in my fancy, so I don't know. Uh, I'd have to, they'd have to grow on me. They would. So, Je so, Jeff, we're, we're going to give you one of those cars. I'll What's take the Fox Body. Yeah. Okay. And then after and, and the then Fox Body. The GTI, the little Screamer. Yeah. Uh, and but then you, the, problem, the Miata would be the in there. The problem is with that era that those cars probably have 300,000 miles on them now. Yeah, there's, they, but they're, they're, you've got parts. You can get parts and you can upgrade and you can, you can add on and you can. You can restore reasonably rod. well or a hot rod. The Mustangs in particular, uh, that Fox body, there's just tons of them out there. I mean, my, really? aunt had, my aunt had one that was a convertible. It wasn't a hot rod. Aunt who? Uh, my aunt that lives here in Canada. Aunt who? Danita. Aunt Danita. Yeah, yeah. So she had a convertible. Oh, it was Aunt B. And, uh, it was it Aunt B? Oh, Aunt D. Aunt B. But it was, it was a real nice driving little car. It was a little car. You know, to me, it had no relationship to the earlier Mustangs of the 70s, that we, 60s and 70s that we grew up with. But it was a neat little car, and there was tons of them around at yeah. the time, and there still are. Yeah. And it's, they're worth something to somebody. Exactly. And that's what makes some of them collectible. And we see stuff like that at some of the car events we yeah, go we to. Do, we yeah, we do, actually. Yes, we do. In all sorts of conditions. Yeah. It, it's it's but you Mazda know, with a Wankel motor in it. Yeah, there's that. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you'd like to get in touch with us, shoot us an email. The address here is info at inwheeltime dot com, and be sure to follow us on Facebook. We're back in a flash. The original group of Loopy Tortilla Restaurants will have you telling your family and friends just what the original recipe means when it comes to the best fajitas in Southeast Texas. Founder Stan Holt invites you to visit the first Loopy Tortilla near I-10 and Highway 6. Here is the original house that inspired the design of all the rest and the original charm that helped make Loopy Tortilla the go-to destination for Houston Tex-Mex. Nothing can compete with the original lime pepper marinade that everyone will agree makes Loopy Tortilla award-winning beef fajitas the best anywhere. Loopy Tortilla Katie's and other local Location that gives you the same quality and service Houstonians have come to expect at Loopy's. It's located on 99 the Grand Parkway at Kingsland Boulevard in Katy. Find yourself in Aggie Land? Head to the Loopy Tortilla in College Station. Located just around the corner from Kyle Field, it's a great place to enjoy those famous frozen margaritas before or after the game. Going to Louisiana? The Loopy Tortilla in Beaumont is on I-10, so you can't miss it. The original group of Loopy Tortilla restaurants has the best Tex-Mex anywhere, and you're invited anytime. That's it for this podcast episode of the In Wheel Time Car Show. I'm Don Armstrong, inviting you to join us for our live show every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and our InWheelTime.com website. Podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart Podcast, Podcast Addict, TuneIn, Pandora, and Amazon Music. Keep listening, and we'll see you soon.